Um, so thanks for being here. It's an inspiration to see so many people interested in this topic. Uh, and I think it comes at a great time in our country's history in an opportune time. Um, I'm going to talk about three things, a little bit about framing, uh, a little bit about policy, and then a little bit about how to make it. Um, on the framing part, I know a lot of this discussion about money and politics starts with what's wrong, because we see it every day. We see it in the super PACs, the headlines about people who write a five or a ten million dollar check to po politics. Uh, we see it when you see the dollars per minute that candidates have to raise these days. And we know something's wrong. We see the deep pockets impacting policy more than the voices of ordinary people. But I think uh, to really get anywhere on this, you have to turn it up on its head and say, okay, that's what we don't want. What is it that we do want? So the conversation, in part, has to be about getting the big money out. But flip that and say, okay, what we'll replaces it? I think most people in this room and most people across the country want to get the people in as well as get the money out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a great uh, phrase which I carry with me everywhere in our the next uh, segment that uh, is closing plenary with Professor Lesson, uh, Larry uses the phrase a lot. Uh, it's a quote from Madison in the Federalist Papers, but our fourth president, when he was helping design the government, uh, said we should have Congress. And in this case, he was speaking about the House. Uh, we want to elect representatives in this form of government creating who are dependent upon the people alone. Dependent upon the people alone. And that's everything this current system is not. So what would a system look like if it were dependent upon the people alone? And just one other fact, besides dependent upon the people alone, I'm going to ask you to keep that with you. Uh, the percentage of people, uh, or the percentage of money for House incumbent candidates that comes from donations of $200 or less, the, an amount that uh, most Americans, not all, but many Americans can afford, $200 or less. Anybody want to guess what the percentage of all the small donations together is for uh, the 435 members of the U.S. House. Just throw out a percent. Three. Two. What? Four hundred. Four hundred percent. Now, it's actually six percent. So about one out of every was that sixteen dollars comes from a small donor. The rest is from a relatively small group uh, of donors. So that dependency. You know, how can you take that six percent and make candidates depend on the people who can get that kind of money? That's the question. And there are a variety of policy answers to that, uh, but I'm going to tell you about one. There are variations on this theme. Um, but let me tell you about this one. I also want to give a shout out to for Susan Anderson, who's lobbied for this policy for 15 years now, uh, alongside the public campaign. Uh, and Adam Smith, our communications director, has been with us six years, uh, was here earlier too. But a fair election system uh, works like this. Again, it's a system in which you'd be more or less dependent upon the people alone for your election. Um, for a house seat, if you want to run some fair elections, you gather 1,500 contributions totaling at least $50,000. It's an average of about $33 each. So $5 would be important, $100 would be important, $100 would be the maximum anybody could give. So it's even smaller contributions than the $200 I was just mentioning. So you amass $50,000 by getting a large, large number of people to show support for you. And then you get money from a public fund, a fair election. Race. And there are system, you get a certain amount for the uh, primary, if you want that, you get the rest for the general. And taking that money, you're, the condition of taking that is you accept no other uh, contribution above $100 ever. So you get enough money to run an average race, a bit over a million dollars for your house seat once you've gotten all those small contributions. If you decide you're in one of those hot races where you're up against a uh, self funded candidate or a billionaire who's putting millions of their own money in, or uh, this, uh, an independent expenditure dumping in a million dollars in the last two weeks of your house race. How do you get more money? Well, you keep gathering more small contributions. They're matched four to one, five to one, six to one. We'll see what that ratio needs to be uh, once we look at the math of this last election. But the idea is you keep depending on ordinary people who can write a small check. Those are the people you're supposed to serve. So that's basically a workable public financing system in a nutshell. We call it the fair election system. And there are ways to tweak that a lot of different ways. And there are different varieties of this. The good news is, uh, at the state level, systems like this, some like this, are in effect. So you have systems, especially in Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut, that are in and for all offices. New York City also has a variation on this theme. Uh, they're in place. We came closer than people know to winning this in Congress, or at least advancing in Congress two years ago, where we had 165 co sponsors in the House 
And if it had gone to the floor, we would have won it in the House, moved it to the Senate, we would have had a big battle in the Senate. But this is not some idea that uh, isn't on the table. It's an idea that has been on the table. It can be on the table again. And it's the reality in several states. So the question is now, if, if there are policy solutions, they're alive in some places, uh, but we can't win it yet. What do we do to win? What do we do to have an electoral system where candidates are dependent upon the people alone? It's, it's a good idea, but uh, in, in this Congress, anyway, we're not going to win it. Um, so I think there are three things that you need to do to advance, generally, uh, pushback on money politics, post Citizens United, uh, with all this deep pocket money in. The first thing is to model victories. We need victories as a movement. And I think the one, the biggest one, that is closest at hand is actually in New York State. So I know there's some New Yorkers here today. Can you raise your hand from New York? So, okay, so when they leave here, follow them. Because the, I think that the, over the next six months, the biggest piece of activity, or actually three months, is going to be um, in now, May, and June, trying to win a system of public financing in New York State. The governor is actually for it. The state assembly, the lower chamber uh, there, has voted out public financing systems before. And we're probably four or five votes away in the Senate. So you could win this in the biggest state, or one of the couple most populous states in the country, with a switch of just two or three votes uh, in, in that legislative chamber of the state Senate. So that's number one, some early victories. And they're possible in other places, too. But New York would be a whopper of a victory to win. It would be the biggest pushback against Citizens United at hand in the next few months. And I think it's there for the taking. The second thing. Um, is that we got to build broad coalitions. And in fact, in New York, there is a broad coalition forming. It includes all the reform groups in New York backing this, but it also includes major labor unions, citizens groups, environmental groups. Uh, and if people read the New York Times earlier this week, it actually involves some of the wealthiest and most powerful citizens and business leaders in New York, too, who are sick of the system. So that kind of a broad coalition, including all the groups whose issues are impacted by this issue, have to come together. In other words, if you are put in disadvantage uh, for your constituency because of the current system, join the coalition, pass it. And those of us who already believe that money in politics is fundamental need to fan out and work with other organizations to come to the table and pressure for changing this issue. And when you think about it, uh, it's probably the 99th the coalition of the 99% in this case that would come together around this kind of solution. So broaden the coalition is critical. And then there's a third thing. Um, we need to make this a political issue. In other words, people have to go down to defeat in their elections because they take big money from special interests, vote against their constituents, and they say they want to keep the system that way forever. People will vote on this issue. And let me give you a quick example before I end. In Arizona, where they have the clean election system already set up, a lot of it was voted in by the people in the conservative state. It was a close vote, but conservatives supported this too, the one with the majority in the 1998 elections put the system in. So, Chamber of Commerce backed lawmakers and leadership in, in the legislature. They've been trying to get rid of it ever since. One of the leaders of that was a state senator uh, who became the Senate president there named Russell Pierce. It's a quick check. How many of you, is, is that name familiar to anybody here? Russell Pierce? Okay. So, my guess is you know him because he's gained greater fame as the lead proponent of that terrible uh, anti-immigration bill in Arizona, SB 1070. So he was the Senate president, led the passage of that. Anti or pro immigrant right groups came together and put his recall on the ballot, but they also needed help because he was from a conservative district. Uh, so there were labor unions who didn't like Pierce either. And at public campaign and working with the reformers in the state, he tried to kill our law, get rid of it, so we didn't like him either. We all came together and we defeated it. But the key point is this the message that took him down on election day, because we needed to win conservative votes was to say he was opposed to clean elections and he was corrupt. And we sent direct mail to 10 to 16,000 people in this district, a total of 85,000 pieces of mail, so we were getting five or six of these, talking about his corruption and mentioning he was opposed to fair elections, or clean elections as it's called in Arizona. And that took him down because the immigrant population, the voting immigrant population in this district was relatively small and it was a conservative district. Um, so between the power of the labor union base, the energy from the immigrant community, and this message about corruption, he left office. So it was a great coalition. It spoke to the power. It spoke to the power of using corruption, calling out corruption. People sell themselves to special interests, 
and then he went down. So that's the third piece of it. The, the victories, immediate victories, the uh, broad coalition, and then finally, being active on election day. And there's a key way, I know a few people here from New York, the rest of you are probably from the, most of you are from the D.C. area. D.C. is the scene of the crime. It's where the money changes hands night after night after night. And if people are going to rise up around the country and take out corrupt lawmakers who are opposed to reform, one place that starts is by shining a floodlight on every single breakfast fundraiser, brunch fundraiser, lunch fundraiser, afternoon tea fundraiser, and evening soiree that happens in this city. And so people in Washington, I think as much as anybody in any other state in the country, can help by showing up those fundraisers and protesting, shining the floodlight. I can tell you, if you do that here, we will take, other people who are reformers will take that message back home and show the people in the districts back home what's going on in D.C., but it helps us for you to set, uh, shine a floodlight on here. So those are my three things and how we're going to win, and also a piece of what we're going to win, and uh, thank you.
that they should not be involved in influence, whether for, um, any job legislation, and foreclosure legislation, student loans, etc. The long list. Um, so, in two weeks, uh, we are going to be our first corporation is um, Bank of America, and we are going to we are going to be um, a number of it's, they expect to have 100 people, 10,000 people outside of the of A, calling on their shareholders. Um, and to actually go inside these shareholder meetings through proxies to actually talk about the issue of money and politics, um, as well as other issues, specifically what I named, um, to build awareness. Um, often in times, you know, shareholders, the purpose of shareholders, they, they look at their profits, but we're going in and talking about how it's bad for business, it's bad, if, if they engage our political system, we are going to expose them and um, we'll do some big social media campaigns around it so that they can see that consumers do not want them engaged on the local process. We are also doing, um, we're also working with some investment firms that control um, millions and millions of dollars of shares with some of these corporations that are introducing resolutions um, in their shareholder meetings. And the shareholders resolutions specifically that um, are up this spring are one at B of A, 3M and Target which actually um, says that the corporation will refrain from any political spending to use any of their treasury funds to actually influence. So that would include independent expenditures, that would include direct campaign um, contributions to candidates, um, and, and, and even ask for, um, they're about to make contributions associations that engage political spending. That's pretty far reaching. Um, so those three shareholders, uh, those three resolutions will be up this, this spring. I strongly encourage many of you to log on to the 99 Power website where you can learn about which shareholders, which meetings are going on in your state um, and which actions you can be engaged in. You know, our motto is, you know, no, co no corporate money, no secret money. Um, and we are going to be there in the coming weeks and we hope that putting the light on directly corporations and their shareholders they won't feel comfortable making those contributions anymore. Another way um, I want to, uh, Common Cause is working to um, address the issue of money politics that's not tied to legislation directly is uh, through exposing ALEC. We are part of a large coalition of a number of organizations that are dedicated to really exposing and pulling the curtain be um, behind the corporations that are funding a lot, that are part of this of this organization that's drafting legislation that really is um, hurting our democracy. Um, I, what we want to do is, is list, is expose these corporations that many groups and individuals don't know are associated with them. You may have seen that over the last week or so, about 12 corporations have, dis have disaffiliated. Um, and so we will look to continue to pressure corporations to ask them to um, who we call them about and ask them to disaffiliate. Um, because the way we look at it is Alec is just another way that corporations um, abuse the system to come around and influence our political system. So those are just a couple of things that Common Cause is working on. I really look forward to the question and the answer section. I know we talked a lot about public financing and we talked about um, constitutional amendment, but I think that the, the Q&A is an opportunity that we can exchange ideas and hopefully bring to the larger tables that we all work on. So, thank you. Those um, particular pieces and 
uh, is uh, leads me to a sort of a way I like to think about how we're approaching this this, uh, this work to get money out of politics. Um, when you think about the different kinds of solutions we can act right now to deal with money in politics, it's really a portfolio. We don't just have one tool; we actually have a range of tools to work with. Um, and we're all trying to do one thing. There's a flood of money that is deluging our democracy. And um, we need to find ways to drive the flood and uh, redraw the boundaries between uh, the land and the sea, as it were. Um, so the disclosure work that many of these groups and many uh, activist groups are doing at the local state national lights like to think of as sunshine, We're trying to dry up some of that uh, money and expose it to the light of day. Um, next, we need to plug the holes. And one way we can plug some of the holes in the first hand is by finding ways to slow down the flow of money in politics. So things like looking at shareholder approval, um, things that can basically force uh, the powerful interests that are pouring this money into our system to slow down, to be held accountable for the practices that are corrosive to our democracy are um, not only ends in themselves, but a means to an end, a way for us to buy the time and build the power that we need to take back our democracy. Um, and then another huge piece is the, the public financing work that, that Nick spoke about so eloquently, which is also an end in itself, and I think part of the vision we share for uh, a long-term solution to the problem. But also, right now, it can be a place of dry land or higher ground that we can reach to get out of the flow of money. Um, but one reason that Public Citizen has committed resources that many others have to focusing on uh, some sort of constitutional amendment to a minimum overturn Citizens United, but perhaps more broadly deal with other aspects of money in politics, money in speech, corporate constitutional rights, is that unfortunately that flood is going to continue um, to uh, pour forth. The waters are going to continue to rise, and we need to kind of go back to the source. And by focusing on um, an amendment or constitutional remedies, um, it's also a means to an end in and in itself. By changing the fulcrum point by which our democracy operates, by going back to first principles and going back to the document that lays out a roadmap for our democracy, we have an opportunity to clarify what democracy really means for us. Um, does it mean that powerful institutions created for economic purposes um, actually have the same voices, the, the same power in our democracy as ordinary people. I don't think we here believe that it does. Um, does it mean that money should equal speech in every particular context? These are complex questions. Public citizen by no means think there's an easy answer to that, but we think by pursuing constitutional reform, it creates a, gives us the opportunity to have a serious conversation about it and opens up the range of possibilities to realize a broader vision um, for a democracy that is dependent on people, for democracy. Uh, that uh, focuses on people power politics instead of money power politics. So when I think about beyond 2012, you've already heard from a number of speakers uh, today, earlier on today, about some of the exciting opportunities there are to, to push for um, a variety of campaign facts reform. We've also heard a little bit about the amendment work that all these groups are doing, whether it's Common Cause, Mutual and others. Uh, you know, we're excited to continue some of the major strategies uh, that we see as vital to pushing for a constitutional amendment that overturn citizens and have a challenge for power. For example, some of the state level uh, resolutions or measures that are being passed in places like Vermont, California, uh, Massachusetts is considering one, New Mexico just passed one. We think those are powerful ways to show broad political support for this call for amendment. We also think the local work is not only going to show that kind of support, but it's also going to build the grassroots infrastructure that we really need um, to be able to make any number of these reforms possible. Um, and we're going to continue to reach out and build a broad range of groups that are uh, prioritizing money and politics work, an amendment strategy, and other range of things. We need to get those constituencies who have a stake in the game to recognize that if they don't work with us to change the game, um, sooner or later the odds are going to be permanently stacked against us. So those are going to be key focal points for our work, and I imagine many others beyond 2012. But I encourage us all to think, um, thank you, to think as, as if we were in sort of the campaign boardroom, as it were, uh, visioning beyond um, the immediate. And, and maybe not focusing so much on specific solutions or answers, but the kind of questions we need to ask. Um, and the, you know, that's what I'm doing right now, because frankly, we don't know exactly what the 
2012 landscape is going to look like in, the, in our post citizen society world. In some cases, it could look very similar, and we'll be able to have some of the same opportunities for victory that, that we've already seen in the last year or two or previously. In other cases, the, the landscape may be utterly changed. Um, certain kinds of policies or, or approaches uh, may be a lot harder to come by. So we need to be thinking about what that landscape looks like, but we need to be returning to some of the kind of perennial questions that I think organizers ask themselves when they're building a campaign. And to me, some of those questions are, um, first of all, you know, uh, I've talked about vision, what is our big vision? Um, we should keep the vision big, because if it's really for everybody here, all the people we know and all the different people, walks of life in America who we believe deserve a stake in their democracy, we need to keep it big enough so that those people have a voice in it. We may not always agree with everybody, but we have to keep it big enough. We also have to keep it principled enough. We do need to have key principles that we're shooting for, things that are um, right lines in the sand. Uh, but we also need to be focused, I think, a little bit more on, um, a, little bit, a little bit less on the minutia of that, and just a little bit more on, if we have a vision, what is the, what is the vehicle that's going to bring us there? Um, so what I mean by vehicle is, um, we focus a lot on you know, how an amendment work, or um, how does uh, a piece of campaign finance reform legislation play on a particular state? Those are tremendously important. Those are make or break questions in many cases. But as organizers, as people who mobilize people in action, we're also the people that need to be thinking about, how do I get my next door neighbor to come to one of these meetings? How do I tell a story about what's going on that's going to relate to their daily life, even if they never opened a book about money and politics? How do I tell a story to them that's going to relate to their experience that's going to make this relevant to them? Um, how do we get uh, the decision makers and the sort of influence makers that uh, determine our public climate, that determine our public discourse um, in the mix. How do we reach them? In some cases, it's going to be by persuasion, um, by uh, focusing as much energy and visibility on our work as we can to reach them so they feel compelled to stand up to be a part of this work. But in other cases, it's going to be understanding how they think and how they tick, and, and approaching them not only as public figures, but as, as people who have a whole range of interests and issues that that motivate them. So that retail thinking but wholesale organizing is going to be the way we build the infrastructure. And that involves taking risks. It involves being focused more on um, a little bit less on what we're signing on the dotted line, but a little bit more on how we build the power to get there. Because if we never build that power, if this conversation stays here, and if we don't take risks and actually extend ourselves outward to, to people who are beyond our frame of reference, we're not going to get there. Um, and in order to get there, in order to extend it, we also have to be willing to challenge some of our own um, sacred cows and to be willing to consider that the, the final package that we get may not be exactly the way we want it, but as long as it has that vision and those key principles, it's going to be what we need. But until we get that power, we're not, not going to get there. So those are the questions that I'm asking myself as I think about where do I want to be, how do I want to bring things forward. Um, I know that's pretty broad and abstract, but I think that's a great starting point to think about how you're going to build your own um, uh, local groups and local groups uh, to move things forward so that um, whichever policy solution you focus on now or later, uh, whichever part of the spectrum of solutions that we want to implement to, to, to pull this all together, um, we're building the kind of groups, the kind of communities that, that are exciting, that are um, motivated, not only because of our vision and the intellectual aspect of it, but also uh, that we're coming from the heart that we're speaking to the things that are most meaningful to them. So, uh, I invite you to join me with that. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share those questions. I'm excited to hear some answers to